Hello, everybody. I hope we are all online and we don't have any technical complications. Uh, I think we should just go ahead and get started. Uh, do we have Dr. Maloney here as well? I don't see her yet. Dr. Maloney, if you can raise your hand in the chat or message in the chat, that'll be great. Because I can't see all the participants, but I assume, let's see. Yeah, for some reason, I can't see Dr. Maloney in the Zoom call yet. So maybe we could give her a few minutes to Join us. I know oh, that she's on. It's quite all right. I have to change her name. Her name is not <laughs> as she should be. Can you hear me? I'm here. Oh, okay. I am here, but I don't, somehow you can't see me, and I don't know how do I get my video going. <laughs> oh, stop my video. Okay, hi. All right. Hello, hi. Dr. Maloney, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the REC Summer Series uh, webinars on Pathways to Decentralized Clinical Trials, sponsored by the Georgetown Howard uh, University Center for Clinical and Translational Science. I'm Asya Paskalev, a bioethicist and a REX member, and I will be your moderator today. Uh, our topic today is using telehealth technology for virtual trials, and we are very fortunate to have here Dr. Maloney, Heidi Maloney, uh, who will be speaking to us on the topic. She is an expert having both the experience uh, from the clinician side as well as the researcher. Uh, Dr. Maloney is the Associate Clinical Director of the Multiple Sclerosis Center of Excellence East at the Veteran, Veteran Affairs uh, Center in Washington, D.C. Uh, she is a clinician caring for veterans with multiple sclerosis and other neurological diseases. And she says that this care is her first love, but she wears multiple hats. She is also a member of the research team that is currently utilizing remote telemedicine and technologies for multiple sclerosis patients, uh, their providers and payers. Uh, she is chairperson of the DC Veteran Affairs IRB and adjunct professor of nursing at the Catholic University School of Medicine. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Maloney. And before I turn the, the floor to her, uh, mm -hmm. I would like to just uh, give you three housekeeping uh, kind of tips or reminders. So um, the first one is that um, we are submitting questions in the question and answer uh, section. Then under uh, what was it under comments? We are addressing any technical issues, and hopefully, there is not going to be any. And my last request is to please stay right after the presentation and do the uh, evaluation. That's uh, that would be very helpful. So, without further ado, I turn it over to Dr. Maloney. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I think you need to stop sharing yours. Very good. Um, uh, let me just figure out where, okay, share my screen so that you can get the slides. Um, oh my goodness. Um, hmm. D can you see the slides? I'm so sorry. Not yet. Okay. Let me just see if I can make this better. Maybe I need to, um, I'm so sorry about this technology. No problem. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Technology is double exactly. That's exactly right. And um, gosh, the rest of this will be a lot smoother. I think what I need to do is just uh, there now. Um, hmm. So Dr. Uh, Maloney, what do you get when you press the share screen button? I get a whole lot of desktop, uh, but I don't see my slides on the desktop. I had them oh. here. Maybe you could share them, and I'll just tell you when you I you have them, don't you? Um, maybe Rainier has the slides. 
I don't have the full presentation handy. Yeah, Rini has the slides. She's supposed to help. Okay. All right. Okay. So maybe if she put them up, I'm so sorry. That's um, okay. okay. No problem. So I can see the slides now. Oh, you can. Oh, yes. Now okay. I can see them. Yes. Okay, super. So yeah, I thought maybe that might have worked. So let me, uh, I'm just going to make them larger just so you can, okay. Uh, you see the slides? Yes, perfect. Super. So uh, obviously this is the title of using telehealth technologies for virtual clinical trial visits. And we've been thrown into this um, because of COVID. And it's probably been a good thing. And I'm going to have some questions for you all at the end of the of the session to just just to check in with you to see how you feel about this as well. Um, just as background and sort of as far as information is concerned, you are aware that I work at the VA Medical Center, and in the VA we have um, the. Um, ORO, which is the Office of Research Oversight, and that office sends down uh, criteria for us in research and guidance for us to, to, uh, to practice good research uh, human protections uh, uh, for subjects. And so in the VA, the COVID-19, uh, because of that, it required an, an immediate administrative hold on all funded studies, anything that was funded, um, and for non-critical interactions. Now, anything that was critical, any, any study that had to do with, with mental health or suicide prevention or any study that required drug delivery where there happened to be the need for safety labs and safety monitoring, those studies were allowed to continue. As an example, uh, I was a, a co-investigator on um, a randomized controlled trial, multi-centered, uh, placebo-controlled obviously, and that trial was giving lipoic acid to veterans with multiple sclerosis. And the aim of that was to see if this supplement, lipoic acid, could um, affect uh, brain atrophy. Did it slow down brain atrophy? And did it help with symptoms like walking ability? The trial's not over, so I don't know the outcome of that trial. Our portion of it is over. Uh, we finished it during COVID, or we just finished it recently, about four months ago. Um, but we continue to have our patients come into the medical center and participate in the study because we had to do uh, safety labs. And we had to do safety labs because lipoic acid had a, um, a poor of, of effect on some kidney function. Uh, so we had to make sure that our patients were in the safety zone. Uh, it was very interesting. And the reason, of course, for the administrative hold, and I imagine this was, was universal in all of your, your um, institutions, was so that we didn't increase the footprint and put any subject at risk for COVID in an institutional setting. So the DCVA also developed guidelines, and their guidelines were a, a stepwise phased in uh, research uh, protocol that uh, did not allow anyone who was not already having an appointment in the VA, any subject not having an appointment could not be brought in as a research subject for research studies. If the person was here because they were an inpatient or if they had a, an outpatient visit, and you all remember that we were curtailing all those outpatient visits, they were very minimal. And we were asking our providers to do most of their clinical care through uh, telehealth. Um, so we really weren't having a lot of folks uh, within person to person face to face study uh, visits. And then we and then researchers got really bright and they started to modify their studies. Uh, and they could do that with IRB and ISSO permissions. So, uh, so that did start to occur. And frankly, that's what this talk is going to be about. And hence uh, the birth of online telehealth telephone recruitment and enrollment and follow-up visits, and some of those things we have been doing as, as, at, at any rate as well. Uh, so let's just uh, set the tone here for what was going on. So what was going on was we had to have regulatory requirements for reporting this administrative hold. So anyone with funded studies had to report to ORO that they were administer, administratively putting their studies on hold. And then those researchers were, were needed to request an extension 
to their research so that they could go beyond, say they were funded for two years, and you know this very well, you, you have funding and it's a, a two-year study, your funding is only for two years, and you need to get the study requirements finished within that period of time. So requesting an extension from the sponsor and from ORO uh, for those studies uh, is, was very important. Uh, and then modifying the study procedures, and, and we'll continue to talk about how they did that. How, how did they modify the study procedures? What technology was used? Um, of course, updating their informed consent form. If you modified your procedures, that changed your informed consent. And participants needed to know that and be very clear on what the procedures were going to be. Uh, including inclusion and exclusion criteria often changed in research. You were now including patients who were capable of um, managing an online study, capable because they either had uh, good uh, internet access, they had to have inter internet access or they could obtain it somehow, um, or they needed to have computers, they needed to show somehow, and that became an exclusion, inclusion, exclusion criteria. And something that I hadn't really thought about uh, until I delved into this talk today uh, to understand it. Yep, that, that, that was important. Uh, and then amending studies uh, for, for some permanent changes. Uh, so certainly some of our, our researchers, and you'll see, amended their studies so that they can continue to do face-to-face -face, um, uh, procedures as well as remote procedures so that they would leave their study open to the chance when we came out of um, the, the, the stricter COVID requirements and stepped up to maybe phase two or phase three where we could have patients in the, clinic, in the medical center face-to-face. Uh, -face. So they um, um, amended them, and, but they didn't um, trash the existing study. And then did the IRB require reconsenting of any of the patients? And that was up to the IRB, the Office of Research um, uh, oversight said to each uh, faci VA facility that it's up to your IRB whether if you rewrite your, cons your informed consent, do you need to go back and consent the, the uh, subjects you already have it enrolled? And for the most part, I think that was a no, uh, because it was, we felt, felt that it was very burdensome on PIs to have to do that. Um, informed consent. Let's talk about that. So there are different methods of doing it. The electronic methods, of course, and the electronic methods um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm, in, I'm actually controlling your slides. Could you let me know when you're going through your slides? Oh, all right. I thought I was. Okay. <laughs> all, um, right. all right. I apologize because maybe I think I have it up and I don't. So I'm on to the uh, next slide, informed consent. Um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so the informed consent is uh, the first bullet point there is electronic methods. There were a couple of electronic methods, and one of them was a, was um, something called uh, uh, Zuri RMS. Zuri RMS was a, a very specific way of using the subject's Gmail or AOL. Uh, if anyone still uses that, my husband still does, so I mention it. Um, but but their own provider. Uh, email service, they could use that email service through something called Zuri RMS, and it was um, I, OIT approved, and it was protected health information, uh, and it was very secure. Now, I have to share with you that the Zuri RMS was a, a, a met criteria, but it was very tedious and cumbersome for patients to be able to use to um, receive informed consents and then send them back. So it wasn't very long lived. It was a way for um, uh, the PIs to send information securely, but it was very difficult for patients to understand the system. They, we had a lot of trouble with, the, with uh, subjects and, and they weren't able to utilize it clearly and cleanly. And they, some subjects actually dropped because they couldn't use the Zuri RMS. So PIs got wise to this very early on and started to drop Zuri. They used it for some specific things where it didn't require the, the subject's input, but if they wanted to send the subject something, they could do it that way. Uh, what happened is we also used DocuSign, and you might be familiar with DocuSign yourself if you've ever had to, um, uh, gosh, I just um, uh, had my house reassessed and um, a new mortgage, and all of the paperwork came through DocuSign. So that's a very secure, um, a method of signing 
of paperwork. Uh, it can't be hacked. And ORD recognizes that. We had to request. So it, it's a license, frankly, that's purchased DocuSign. So our Office of Research Development purchased initially 100 envelopes or copies of DocuSign. And that didn't uh, wasn't enough. Um, and then I understood they, they went and they purchased 300. Uh, some of our researchers who have large studies, maybe of, of greater than 100 patients, and you had to have greater than 100 to, to participate in the DocuSign, used this method of signing an informed consent and used it very smoothly and nicely. Another way of doing it is to, to request from your IRB a waiver of documentation of consent. And therefore, you would draw up a single sheet of paper that the, the uh, PI had in front of them um, saying to the participant, you have received this either through a mailing or, or through the um, Zuri RMS uh, email system. You've received the informed consent. You have read it. So it's a three-way call or a video conference with a subject and impartial witness in the investigator. So the impartial witness and the investigator hear that the subject um, consents to the research and they write that on the piece of paper. And then we are, at least in our, our institution, um, our IRB and R&D committee require that we upload that piece of paper with the witness's signature and the in investigator's signature of this um, uh, uh, informed consent by, by uh, video or voice. And we upload that to the research compliance officer. We also have a system here where we have something called IMED consent. And that is, um, is a consent process for any clinical procedure. And we can also do research IMED consent if the patient's in clinic. So that is, a, a, frankly, that, that, that doesn't even make sense because the person would have to be here. Um, so we had a standardized process. We'd identify who's on the call, We'd review the informed consent uh, form with the patient or the subject, excuse me. We confirm with the witness, the subject's questions are all answered. Um, this is for the, the three-way call. The verbal confirmation from the subject of agreement to participate was there. And then the subject uh, signs and dates the informed uh, consent that was previously mailed. And at some time they would, would bring it back or they could mail it back. Um, so that was the standardized process. Um, the witness that providing documentation of, uh, remember I just said we had a waiver of documentation of documentation of consent. Uh, we could attest, there was an attestation of the witness and the investigator. The, the, the uh, informed consent could be photographed and sent by this Zuri RMS, or it could be photographed and sent in the VA system through um, a, a patient portal called My Healthy Vet. Vet. And that patient portal has a secure messaging option, very secure, obviously. And the um, photograph of the informed consent could be sent that way. Um, and then, of course, copies of that informed consent signed by the investigator and the witness are placed in the study records. I'm going to go to the next slide. Thank you. So HIPAA authorizations are similar. So the HIPAA, HIPAA authorizations, uh, you may obtain a re remotely by signing at home and sending by VA fax or our digital imaging to My Healthy Vet Secure Messaging. Uh, mailing was not recommended for the HIPAA. Uh, IRB may approve to waive the HIPAA authorization and documentation of the HIPAA authorization. So this is just how we got, uh, uh, how we handled, managed to handle HIPAA during uh, this, this remote uh, access. Uh, next slide, please. So this next slide, next slide. Okay, good. Uh, is talking about uh, approved video communication technologies. So we did that via VA Video Connect, which is a secure, we call it VVC in the VA. Uh, this is not specifically helpful for you if you're not in the VA, and I'd like to know what your methods were. Uh, did you use Zoom? Zoom was not approved, frankly, um, but Apple FaceTime was approved. Facebook Messenger video chat is approved. These are ORO and ORD approved um, uh, areas where you uh, uh, methodologies that you could do um, a video call with your with your subject. Google Hangout video, Skype, and WhatsApp. Things like um, uh, well, other others were not approved. So these are the approved uh, connect 
in the VA, it's preferred to do VVC is the prefer preferential. Uh, next sl slide, please. Now let's talk about web-based surveys. And the web-based surveys are the, the two approved web-based surveys for collection of, of questionnaires and survey material were Weststat and Qualtrics. And I think everyone's pretty familiar with those um, areas of, of, for um, obtaining questionnaires and survey data. They collect data, they're, they're forums for collecting data. Um, and of course, then uh, PIs could do, conduct phone visits for, for collecting survey data as well. And that's been going on for eons, correct? Uh, the next, let's talk about, next slide. Let's talk about how technology actually was working. What, what, what's, how did we operationalize this? What, what, how did the investigators modify this? So I'm going to talk to you, and I have permission to do this, uh, with the investigators that, that I will focus on. Um, and there are three investigators I'm, I'm going to, to um, talk about and, and show you their work and how they modified. There are others. Uh, but some of the sponsored research was definitely put on hold because they required inpatient visits, face-to-face -face visits, and working through technology just didn't work well. Or I might say that maybe those PIs or investigators weren't as inventive as the ones I'm going to present to you today. So this is going to be real-world evidence of how it works. Let's just have the next slide, please. So funded research projects adapt. And these investigators were Dr. Matthew Reinhardt and Dr. Michelle Constanzo. Uh, and let's go on to, to the next slide. And I'm just gonna show you some others. So these investigators uh, were with the War Related Illness and Injury Study Center, and that's their logo you can see. Um, these two investigators, Reinhardt and Costanzo, did a brilliant, I mean, I am telling you a brilliant job of modifying their research to meet their needs of their participants and meet the needs of the PI. These are funded studies, both of these studies. And, I, and then I'll, on the right-hand side of the screen is the investigator, Dr. Uh, Mitch Walleen and myself. We, we had a, some uh, several research studies. Uh, we had te a telehealth study that we utilized and I'll talk about them. Um, I'll talk about these specific studies and how these groups of researchers adapted their research. So let's talk, see the next study. So this is uh, Dr. Costanzo's individualization of an exercise. I'm on the next slide, excuse me. Thank you. Um, individualization of an exercise program guided by heart rate variability in veterans with chronic multi-symptom illness. So this is a pilot study conducting a randomized clinical trial with two study tracks. They had an on-site track, and remember I mentioned that, they didn't wanna throw away their old protocol, but they wanted to modify it. They wanted to make sure they had the on-site track so that they can, when the opportunity presented itself, they could continue the on-site track. And then they had a remote track. So the on-site track included supervised exercise sessions within this research, clinical research center. Uh, at RVA, we are uh, so fortunate to have um, a large research-only exercise room. It was uh, purposed many years ago for um, diabetics to work on lifestyle modifi modifications and not necessarily research, but then it became research and taken over by research. So we have treadmills, we have exercise bikes, we have um, step step machines. Uh, it, it looks like a mini gym. It is a mini gym. Um, then due to COVID related risks, a remote track was added for Dr. Costanzo's research to, to um, offer home-based exercise interventions and leverage remote technology. And they did this brilliantly to collect the data from participants. They had activity monitoring, monitoring devices, heart monitoring devices, um, and there was their study went on to recruit participants for this remote track to minimize COVID-related risks for both the research staff and the veteran, so, uh, which was obviously um, important thinking there. And they indicated that in the future, the on-site assessment will resume, as I said, but only when the PI decides it's safe to allow participants to exercise on-site. Um, and it's, it's not just the PI, um, our medical center director, and our um, ACOS for research have a lot to say about that. 
So regardless of the track, the participants will be randomized into one to two groups. They're a traditional exercise program of moderate intensity, which is called the TRAD group, or the HRV guided exercise program group. Uh, let's go to the next uh, um, slide, please. Um, so how did the investigators modify their study? So they, they first presented amendments to the IRB. And uh, this included an amendment to their protocol to add the remote track, uh, amendment to their consent form to add the remote track and to talk about the procedures, specific procedures um, in their informed consent form. Uh, they, they had inclusion exclusion criteria changed as well, and, and it changed because it had to include patients who had the capability, both cognitively and physically, to do remote research. Did they have good uh, internet access? Uh, did they have um, a, a smartphone or did they have a, a computer that, that they could use? Uh, recruitment revised the study duration from one year to two years due to because the enrollment was suspended during almost an entire year of COVID, um, certainly nine months. I think they started this back in September. Uh, so the protocol changes, what were their pro pro protocol changes? The inclusion criteria I said was the ability to exercise independently. And that was another very important thing. Could this group exercise independently? Were there risks uh, to these participants if they were independent? Um, and then they wanted to make sure that they were independent in exercising having strong Wi-Fi connection, able to engage in research activities remotely from home, and having a smartphone with a plan that includes the ability to download specific apps that were important to this research. So this is well thought. If you just read those, what I have on the slide here, this is a well-developed, thoughtful uh, PI who, who really didn't leave any stone unturned in thinking through her remote study. So modifications to phone screen to update the inclusion criteria as well. So let's continue on to the next, um, uh, the next uh, slide, thank, thank you. So amendments to access technology for measuring remotely heart rate and va variability. So this is, a, 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 you know, how did they collect their data? What were some of their uh, needs here? Um, so they added a remote track to include remote data collection, uh, consumer act, activity monitor and a heart rate monitor. And I'll explain in a little bit exactly what that was. Uh, their data collection was to reduce the burden to the, to the subjects. They used a more user-friendly device called an MFIT QS. And what is that? Well, they wanted to measure uh, their sleep, their sleep-wake cycles. And they did that through a thin strip that was placed under the mattress and that had biosensors and to collect heart rate, breathing, and movement during sleep. So that exists. They knew that exists, that, that technology. Uh, this is a funded study. They could purchase that, and they mailed it to each participant with um, both uh, very clear instructions on how to place the, the, the MFIT QS uh, and where to place it. Um, and then this group had questionnaires, their remote collection via Qualtrics survey, uh, and was the platform for, for um, um, having their questionnaires returned. They, they had paper copies if a participant's, that was their preference. So they again thought of everything. Could the participant work the Qualtrics survey? Uh, would it be easier if they had um, uh, paper copies? Uh, should they just be phoned, phoned up and, and um, get the survey data on the telephone? So they had an amendment to, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> the, an amendment to modify the format for delivering the psychometric questionnaires. So not only did they do these things, they made sure that they amended their protocol and that, that the IRB saw those amendments, met amendments and that they were accepted. They added an instruction manual that was set to each of the participants. They updated their security plan to use additional computers for data analysis. They modified their informed consent and their HIPAA authorizations and they modified their recruitment letter. So all of these were the modifications that were amendments to their protocol. I'm gonna to go to the next slide, please. And I wanna talk about Dr. Reinhardt's study. His study, he's also part of the War-Related Injury and Illness uh, Center uh, with a funded study. Dr. Reinhardt has a lot of funding and a lot of funded studies. You might wanna ask him to be a participant um, in one of your talks because he's uh, very engaging and he's very knowledgeable. So, or Dr. Costanzo. 
his study was a multimodal observational study of veterans with TBI with varying symptoms. So the aims of that study were to understand the physical and psychological consequences of traumatic brain injury using a multimodal observational inventory. And there was a couple of things. Now, traumatic brain injury is actually very difficult to, um, to, to describe, to monitor, and, and diagnose. Um, that, so they did it through these modalities, psychological assessments, neurocognitive activity measured using an EEG, this is kind of amazing again, very out of the box, and eye movement tracking. So they had, and, and I'll show you later, they had a home EEG monitor that was portable because these folks couldn't come into the clinic to understand neurocognitive activity, to get objective measurements. Now, the psychological assessment uh, can be objective, but again, it's what the, what the patient says it is. So it's probably more of a subjective monitoring tool. Then they had neural structure and functional organization using magnetic resonance imaging scans. Uh, that didn't go to the home. <laughs> that was for the on-site uh, piece of their, of their uh, study. Um, then they had sleep using actigraph and ballistocardiography. And I'll explain those in the next slide, what those are. And then they had self-report questionnaires. So those were the five uh, modalities that met the aims of their physical and psychological consequences of TBI. Uh, next slide, please. Good. So multimodal observational study of veterans with TBI with varying symptoms. What was their methodology? They had remote consenting. Uh, and they did the remote consenting through the, the, they started to do it incidentally through the um, methodology I mentioned earlier the Zuri RMS, but that Zuri RMS was very problematic for um, the subjects. They had a, a lot of difficulty. And you can imagine subjects with TBI are subjects that are um, disabled. Uh, th th they have some difficulty with cognitive measures and, and they have uh, sometimes physical difficulty. So they found that their remote consenting was done best through My Healthy Vet and through the secure messaging. Uh, remote data acquisition. So their questionnaire data was acquired through Qualtech, using Qualtechs. Quantitative uh, remote uh, data was acquired using commercially available devices. Portable electroencephalography. Now this is called MUSE2. And it's a measure um, of, of brain activity uh, using an, a, a portable EEG in the home. And this would be mailed to the patient with an instruction manual on how to set it up. And obviously, if it was needed, the, the investigators were on the phone with the individual uh, helping them uh, with the leads and helping them understand how to set it up, measures of, 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 of uh, brain activity. The ballistic cardiography, called MFIT, was a measure of sleep and autonomic measures. So it was also um, a device the could, what was attached to the person and measured sleep and autonomic measures. And then actigraphy measured sleep and activity, kind of like a Fitbit. And that was mailed to, all these things were mailed to the participants. On-site data acquisition is currently paused. So they still have a pause. And our, I have to share with you that our, v, our medical center just went back to the highest level of concern for COVID transmission due to the Delta variant. And that was a sad um, that this is occurring and this is happening. So our research then went back from phase two back to phase one where we're still on hold for any face-to-face -face study visits unless the patient, unless the, that participant happens to have come into the, in, as an inpatient or happens to have a face-to-face -face, um, visit in the, in, the, in the medical center with an outpatient clinic. Now that's going to be, that's not going to be happen, happening because when our medical center went back to high, high alert, we went back to 25% um, of, of attendance here with, with patients. So that is likely we're going to be put on hold, Dr. Reinhardt, for, for quite a while. Uh, let's go on to the next uh, innovative investigations. Next slide. 
So not just innovative, innovative investigations, these are innovative investigators, and I hope you're appreciating that. So again, they created two tracks, an on-site plus remote, and the remote only track, they have a remote only, uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic, it says we, that's Dr. Reinhardt's group, are currently offering re the remote only track, and that's pretty clear. Uh, procedures to be performed remotely, screening and consenting. They mailed devices to patients. They had a training session to train the study participants on the EEG device, the MUSE-2, and the sleep assessment, MFIT QS, the actigraphy, and then they had a sleep diary as well. So they had a training session. Uh, I don't know if they did that in group. I actually don't know that. Um, a group session, or they did that individually. They had a seven-day baseline data collection just to see if they were getting it right. Um, a portable EEG device, three-minute eye open and close in the morning and the evening. The MFIT QS was placed under the mattress for seven-day period for assessment of sleep and heart rate variability. And then the actigraph worn on the non-dominant wrist for seven-day period for assessment of physical activities. They had remote questionnaires through Qualtrics and then seven-day continuous monitoring using commercially activity monitor Fitbit. These, of course, were all supplied to participants. Um, let's do our next slide, please. Um, a consent process remotely. So the study team members sent the copies of the consent electronically to the potential study participants. The team members uh, uh, reviewed the consent form, answered any questions that the participants had, and allowed time for the participants to make an informed decision remotely, remotely through VA Video Connect. This language comes from their protocol. So this isn't something that they told me. They have this written down. The participant photographed or scans the signed consent form and electronically sends that document back by two methods, via Azure, which is a, a, um, a platform, or My Healthy Vet back to the team members. Azure is a, is a email platform that's secure. Uh, the participant receives a signed copy of the consent form electronically afterwards. They receive it afterwards electronically. Um, then let's go to the next slide. Other remote technologies. I just want to um, point out that uh, the remote EEG, and we've talked about all of these, but I just wanted to reinforce how brilliant these are. Uh, the EEG is an important marker of brain function. Since advanced EEG machines are large and difficult to use, the study uh, provided a low density portable EEG monitor to help collect EEG in the home using the MUSE-2 portable EEG device. Then their ballistocardiography was a measure of the ballistic forces. Now, what does that mean? That means as the heart dublubs, you know, contracts and, um, and uh, pumps, the body actually shifts a little bit. You don't notice it as you're sitting there quietly in your chair, but it does that. There's a ballistic movement. And that ballistic force is generated through the heart's contraction and it can be measured. So the technique for producing a graphic representation of the repetitive motion of the body is used through this ballistic cardiography. Uh, pretty amazing. Uh, and then there's actigraphy, a measure of sleep uh, parameters, sleep wake cycle, and it's worn on the wrist. Uh, there's, there is that other one we talked about, the, the strip put under the mattress. Uh, there are remote labs, um, nurses that make house calls to draw blood in the home. So cutting edge technology, I put a little smile there. Of course, that's been done for years. I remember doing home visits 30, 40 years ago. Um, uh, that actually shows my age, Let, let's say 20 years ago. Uh, remote vital sign monitoring can occur in the home and um, all of those things are other remote technologies. Let's go on to the next slide, please. Now, I want to just briefly talk about Multiple Sclerosis Telehealth Utilization Project, and this is a project that Dr. Waleen and myself, we, we endeavored. It was a, a sponsored through the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, their healthcare delivery and policy research priority on telehealth utilization. So the MS Society is uh, very forward thinking. Uh, they are uh, probably the premier, premier nonprofit uh, group for uh, spending most of their nonprofit income on research. 
some of it, of course, goes to, to clinical patient um, support, but, but probably 60% or more of their dollars go toward research, which is wonderful. And they uh, funded uh, our, our uh, telehealth study and it was a multiple sclerosis telehealth utilization project. And it was to really to understand who uses telehealth and what are the barriers through three different aims. There was um, three parts to this study. Early on, uh, a couple of years ago, we looked at large database review of the entire United States, all in a large database using Medicare, Medicaid data to understand who was using telehealth and how were they using it, and frankly, very little. And then we went through an MS database to look who's using telehealth and who's not. And in the VA system, we've had a mandate for the last 10 years to utilize telehealth for some of our clinical care. Uh, and that was an initiative that the VA put out in order to capture veterans in remote areas. Uh, it wasn't because of COVID, it was because the VA recognized the need to reach, to extend their reach and we had the technology in place and the VA has per perfected this technology year after year until we really have it down to a pretty fine um, measurement uh, without very many glitches at all. Um, so it's a secure, so the video uh, VVC, VA Video Connect is a secure platform for reaching patients. So then, then we, at number three was specific facilities and barriers in a qualitative study of survey of patients, providers, and payers. And I presented this data in an earlier, um, um, back in May, when I spoke to your group back then, not the summer program, but the, the, the greater GUX research program, um, uh, to, to tell you uh, uh, that patients and providers uh, ultimately really enjoyed this and payers were willing to pay for some uh, of the research. Now, COVID just moved it from sitting at the side of the pool to diving right in. So we took the deep dive because of COVID. We looked at providers outside the VA. We looked at providers throughout the country at, in, at Georgetown, at, at UVA, in California and in New York City. Um, and they all said, that their telehealth visits with patients were pretty bleak until they had COVID and they were um, forced to do them. Payers waived um, payment for, for they, they waived the need to collect payment for, for telehealth visits. Th those visits were free to patients uh, at the beginning. I think that they are pulling back, they start or they're going to pull back uh, starting in September and starting to charge for those visits. Um, this was a minimal risk study. Uh, the verbal and witnessed informed consents were obtained and video interviews with both individuals and groups. We, we had groups for a while and we realized uh, we stopped doing group visits because it was very difficult. Some patients weren't speaking because others were taking over and that's just the nature of, of doing group research. And some of that is important, but for us it was important to understand each individual's assessment of, of telehealth with their provider, uh, what it was they liked, what they didn't like, what were some of the barriers, and we learned a lot. We are now, we're finished with the study and publishing that data, and we are uh, doing, a, doing, we are developing a YouTube video on best practices for uh, telehealth, and I'll forward that information to you when, when we have it all done. We're going to do it in November. Um, so my last slide, if you can pull that up, and, and gosh, I didn't realize uh, that I could speak this long for just 20 slides. <laughs> so let's do the last slide, please. Um, so the last slide has some questions, and I hope that in the next 15 minutes we can talk about some of this. Do you think remote research methods um, conti will continue beyond COVID restrictions, um, beyond in-person research? Do you think we'll continue? And I just want to stop for a minute and, and allow you to chime in. Yeah, that's great. People could use the question and answer section. Okay, I'm going to. Um, uh, get back with you and see and. Um, so uh, I'll be monitoring the questions. Yes, could you read them to me because somehow uh, I've. 
Yeah, I, I don't see any questions right away. Maybe we could get okay, all your questions. Yeah, let's get all of your questions and maybe we could process them that way. I would agree. That's a great idea. So the second question is, how could remote methods like recruitment, obtaining informed consents, data collection, either enhance or detract from research operations? Do you see any way, like I did mention, patients dropped from studies because they couldn't use the secure email. They couldn't, they just were unable to make it work for them. Uh, what, what else do you think of? Have you used this? Um, or maybe everything that I've sent to you is brand new and and absolutely a gift. <laughs> Are people more willing or less willing uh, to participate in research when it's remote? Uh, are there pitfalls to protecting human subjects engaged in remote research studies? And so I think that's maybe our the, the biggest question I, I might want to ask. Um, well, if, thank ahead. you. Thank you very much, Dr. Maloney. Uh, I hope people are going to jump in at this point. These are all, first, thank you for the great presentation, very informative, and thank you for the great questions, a lot to think about. Uh, I don't see a question at this very moment, so I'm going to kind of... Uh, take uh, advantage of my privilege as a moderator and ask you one. Uh, it looks like the VA was the perfect place to start moving to virtual or to advance it because you had all the uh, layers of protection that are necessary to take yes. care of safety, security and privacy issues. Uh, so my question is for other institutions that are not so well situated already. Apparently that's something to, to be desired, but what should they look for or where should they go to get some of these needs met? Like in terms of like protecting participant privacy, uh, ensuring confidentiality, because even when you have an interview with the participant in their home, there could be other people, people not always have the perfect space to, to you know, secure privacy and so on. So I'm thinking in these specific details that kind of touch on ethical issues, which is what I'm really interested in. Yeah, that's a great, great question. So the ethical issues, and, and you brought up something really important. In our video calls, uh, it, even as a clinician, when we do clinical calls, we have to make sure that the, the, the person in the room, if there's someone with them that they're introduced and they understand that with, and they have consent to have them there. <laughs> and so, but to get back to your ethical question, I would go to your IRB. If you don't have a, a research oversight organization, and I thought everyone did, but maybe not. Um, if you if there, if that doesn't exist outside the VA, then I would go to the IRB or your research and development committee and go to the chair of that and bring this question to four. The protection is all in amendments to the informed consent. It's all in the informed consent. And you may say in that informed consent, when the video is done, uh, there should be no one in the room and or put a, create, create the, um, parameters of that video. Make sure that, the, that 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 is very clear to the participant and to anybody, uh, and make sure that's even in the, in the informed consent. But I would ask your IRB first, I would go to them for the guidance, uh, and they can guide you further. Now, I hope that's enough. I mean, I, I am not familiar with the outside world, so <laughs> do you have something to contribute? Uh, have you thought this through? Well, one thing that uh, has been kind of gaining traction lately is actually ensuring that our IRBs have the capacity to evaluate technology, the relevant technologies. And I think one of the trends is to have IT experts and privacy experts uh, join IRBs. That's fairly new development, I believe, but probably very important one as well. So I was wondering, do you have such experts on your IRB? Uh, no, they don't sit on the committee, but we have a privacy officer and we have an um, information security officer, an ISO. And every time a protocol comes through, they, it, it's signed off by each of them. So they have eyes. And all of the equipment that I spoke about in the, in the remote um, visits was signed off by the ISO. The ISO. So that all was... Um, sent through the, not just the privacy, but the information security officer. And that's probably the most important thing. And, and I don't know, do other institutions have that? So they don't sit on the board, they don't sit on the, they don't come to the committee meetings, but they're integral to the process. We can't pass this on, we can't pass the research 
study on to our research and development committee for final approval until there's sign off by the information security officer and the privacy officer. I see. And again, that's one of the advantages of the VA that other institutions probably don't have, or at least don't have it instituted already in place. Yeah. All right. So, so I, go ahead. Go ahead. I will just gonna turn to our question and answer and see if I'm not overlooking somebody, but um, I, again, I don't see, I think people are still taking in the information. Right. Um, so, and if they, um, and if they haven't ahead. actually done this sort of research, if they're, they may not know what questions to ask. One of my, one of my next question, again, I'm really enjoying this opportunity uh, is, do you have any uh, kind of impressions of what uh, kind of discu what discourages participants other than the sheer access to technology, which is in and of itself a concern because we know about the digital divide, and uh, this may raise some questions about you know um, bias in selection and so on when we are including by necessity, of course, in this case, only people who have the technical literacy and the means to participate, but that's a separate question. But I'm also curious, right. do you know how concerned participants were about being in a remote trial versus a physical? What was like, I don't know if there are any studies from your side or just in general, what discourages people from continuing or joining such a study? Well, that's a great question. And I don't have feedback from Dr. Reinhardt. He has seven participants enrolled and I might ask his feedback, but you're right. First of all, it is gonna create bias because his exclusion criteria are people who don't have Wi-Fi or can't participate. So it does, it's not uh, generalized, uh, liable completely. So I think that there is bias in it. And I also think pay, uh, participants might be reluctant because they're not sure if the data that's being collected is seen only by the research team. Could this data be um, seen by anyone else? So they have to be assured that the EEG data or the actigraph data uh, collecting on their sleep is only collected and sent to the research team and no one else can see it. So I'm not sure what assurance is given uh, to participants uh, unless that's written in their informed consent. Um, so that's a good question. And I'm gonna check into that myself. It's a great question. And it would be one of the barriers. Great. Thank you very much. So uh, I would like to encourage again our audience if they have any uh, questions to please uh, put them in the Q&A because we are coming to a close and I want to make sure that everybody had the opportunity to um, to ask a question or to share a position or experience. Um, this is Jane here. How would, what would be the role of the RB in terms of protecting human subjects engaged in remote research studies? What role should they add to whatever they do to make sure that this protection is there? Well, I would say it's huge. Um, the IRB has to make sure that all of the documents, all of the regulatory documents are in place and up to date. And the, the, the informed consent uh, talks about the remote uh, and how it's being done and the procedures are, are documented in the informed consent. So the IRB has a role in making sure that the amendments to update the, the remote protocol are, are in place. And then the IRB also has the role of making sure that the information security uh, officer and the privacy officer also sign off and understand that, that uh, protections are in place. So, so there, I, I, meant, I talked about HIPAA and we, you can have waivers, but the IRB has to stipulate that that is okay to waive the HIPAA, um, the documentation of HIPAA, not to waive the HIPAA, but to waive the documentation of it. And, and it, because it's done in a different way. So I would say the IRB um, committee and staff and, and administrative officer uh, have a large role to play in, in the protection of human sub subjects in remote studies. And I, I presented uh, the, Reinhard, the Reinhardt and the Costanzo study um, mainly because they're doing a, a great job and, and they're prototypes of, of, of a wonderful 
uh, protocol and uh, a, a wonderful uh, techniques and procedures uh, remotely. They are the ideal and they thought of everything. And, and that, gave, that gave the IRB almost the, the um, not, they gave the IRB the knowledge that that's how it should be. This is exactly how it should be because they came to us with these ideas and we were just congratulating them on how well they protected the human subjects. With all the secure methods, methods all of them are secure. The video connect, the, the, the patient portal, and your hospitals all have patient portals, so that and those are secure. So that may be another way of, of doing your research through the patient portals. Okay, this is a great uh, great suggestion, and I think we are now have to, we are yeah running out of time. So I would like to thank you very much, Dr. Maloney. I'm sure we could continue this discussion, and we will continue it. I yeah. hope at other uh, occasions. So uh, thank you everybody for participating. And I would like to remind you about the survey, which we'll be uh, getting at the end. So please take your moment to first thanks again, Dr. Maloney, and then take the survey. Thank you again. And uh, please be back here in a couple of weeks uh, for our last seminar in the lecture series. Thank you. Thank you. You can email me if you need, have any other questions. Thanks and have a nice day, everybody. Bye-bye.